My wife, Lorena, and I have been married for 35 years. And I've often said that after uh, putting my faith in Jesus when I was eight years old, asking her to be my wife was the best decision I ever made. But I have to say, it wasn't what I would call an easy decision. I'd grown up in a family where, that taught me that marriage was a holy thing. And I expected to make this decision only once in my whole life, and I wanted to get it right. By the time we had been dating a year and a half or so, we got to that stage in a relationship where a decision kind of had to be made. Were we going to do this or not? Was I going to do this or not? I knew I loved her, but marriage, how do you make that decision? I remember wrestling with questions like, how do I know that my feelings for her won't change over time? How do I know her feelings for me won't change over time? How can I know that 5 or 10 or 20 years from now, we'll both still enjoy the same things and be committed to the same things? How can I know? How can I know she'll be a Cubs fan? But mostly I found myself asking, is she the one God has for me? Is she God's plan for my life? We're in a summer-long series called, Did God Say That? And we've been looking at a series of sayings that sound like something God would say, but turn out to be only part of what God actually did say in his word. In the last couple of weeks, Pastor Jeff has talked to us about money is the root of all evil. Last week, it was love the sinner, hate the sin. And by the way, if you didn't get to hear either one of those messages, go back, watch online, some really, really good stuff there. Today, we're going to take on this saying, God has a perfect plan for your life. God has a perfect plan for your life. Does he? Is that true? Does God have a perfect plan for your life and for my life? Well, here's my short answer. Yes and no. Let me try to explain. Now, throughout the Bible, it's true that we find verses like this, Psalm 139. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Now that sounds like God has a plan. Or a more familiar verse, Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Now even though that promise is for the people of ancient Israel and not necessarily for us, it certainly does sound like God has a plan. But I actually want to begin in another place today. I want to begin with an obscure verse that's tucked way back in the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy. Actually, I don't think I'd ever studied this verse before I started working on this particular sermon. So here it is. Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29. Here's what it says. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. But the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may follow all the words of this law. Now these ancient words, which came at a time when God was reestablishing his covenant with his people, tell us that there are secret things that belong only to God, and there are revealed things that belong to us and our children, that we may follow all of God's word. So the Bible seems to be saying that there are things about God's plan that we can know. There are also things that we cannot know. So, which is it? Does God have a perfect plan for my life? Or is his plan a secret? Do I have to figure it out on my own? I want us to think of God's plan uh, in two ways, symbolized by my props up here, these two big boxes. Uh, This box, the question mark box, represents the secret things the unknowable part of God's plan. Things that we are unable to understand, like how did God create the entire universe by just speaking his word? Like why did God create the dinosaurs when human beings were never going to be around to see them? Like why can't the bears find a quarterback? You know, stuff like that. In this box are all the things that inquiring minds would love to know, that we're desperate to know. Where should I go to school? What job should I take? Who should I marry? Uh, What's going to happen with COVID-19? All these questions are in this box because they are the things that God knows but we cannot know. And this box is taped shut. I can't open it. 
But this other box over here, the one marked with an exclamation point, uh, represents the revealed things. These are all the things about God's plan that we already know. And as we're going to see a little bit later, this box is relatively easy to open. Here's the issue, I think. Many of us, I think, spend a lot more energy thinking about and worrying about this box, the secret box, the things that we cannot know, than we do about this box, the revealed things box. And when we say or hear, God has a perfect plan for your life, I think we often jump immediately to thinking about this box. We hear God has a great career in mind for you. Uh, God has picked out that one person in all the world that you should fall in love with and that you should marry. God has planned out 2.5 children and a couple of nice cars and a dog. He has a perfect plan for you, and it's a plan that sounds a lot to us like the American dream. I think we most often think of God's plan as a kind of blueprint. Uh, and somehow we have to find this blueprint. We have to follow it to the letter in order to be in God's will, in order to be in God's plan. And we pray and we wonder, and we, but we wonder how do we know what God's will is for us? How do we find it? How can we know for sure we're in it? But is that really what God's word tells us? What if God's plan is more like a compass than it is a blueprint. I want to try to answer three questions today. What can we know about God's plan? What can't we know about God's plan? And how can we live in God's plan? First, what can we know about God's plan? Uh, let's start with this box. Let's start with uh, what God has already revealed to us about his plan. Almost every week you're going to hear at least one of us say, and usually several of us will say, uh, that we, want, we believe that God wants you to experience grace, grow in faith, and make an impact right where you are. And we say those three things because we think they are all three right here in this box. I'm going to talk about three things here. Uh, the first thing, I actually have props inside my props today. This is a gift. And this gift here is to represent salvation, the gift of salvation. It's what we mean when we say experience grace. Grace is the gift that God wants to give to each one of us. In Ephesians, the Apostle Paul tells us, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, listen, in accordance with his pleasure and will. God's pleasure and will are that we would be adopted as sons and daughters through faith in Christ. Again, Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 2. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. This is good and is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Now that's pretty clear, I think. God desires all people to receive the gift of salvation, to know the gift of his grace. So God's revealed will, God's plan for your life, begins with a relationship with himself. That is, the entire universe was created with this gift in mind. You were created with this purpose in mind to know the one who created you in love, and offers you salvation through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So when we say God wants you to experience grace, we're saying that the first and most important thing to know about God's plan for you is this gift. The gift of his grace, the gift of salvation. The gift that gives you a new heart, a new identity, a new purpose, and a new destiny. Grace is where God's plan for you begins. But there's something else. The second prop I have in my big box here is just a simple jar of a bottle of hand sanitizer. We see this all over the place these days uh, in our lives. And I'm going to explain uh, why I'm using that as an image here in just a minute, because it's to symbolize sanctification, the second thing God wants for us. I'm going to explain that word in just a minute. It's what we mean when we say grow in faith. 
In Colossians chapter 1, Paul writes, And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will, that's God's plan for salvation, in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. So once we experience grace, the gift of forgiveness, and the new life we have in Christ, Paul says we are to then walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. We are to bear fruit in every good work. We are to increase in the knowledge of God. He's saying that God wants us to grow in faith. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we read, It is God's will plan that you should be sanctified. Now, that word sanctified is kind of a churchy sounding word, but it just means uh, being made pure, being made clean, being made holy. That is being made more like Jesus in the way we live. Paul is saying that when we experience grace, we receive this gift, we are born again with new hearts through the forgiveness of sin, but we also have a new identity. We are to put off the old self, put on the new self, and grow to become more like Jesus himself. Uh, Thirdly, let me take the gift out here again. I have a third drop inside here. Uh, Yep, it's what you think it is, a pineapple. Now, some of you may be thinking uh, the TV show Psych. Some of you may be thinking SpongeBob. Uh, I'm not thinking either of those things, just that pineapples are fun. And I want it to represent what it means to bear fruit, to bear fruit. This is what we mean when we say to make an impact where you are. So God's plan is for each of us to experience the gift of his grace, uh, to grow in our faith, become more like Jesus, and then it says to bear fruit. Now, what does that mean? Well, Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 5. He writes, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. These are the personal qualities, the spiritual qualities that the Holy Spirit wants to grow in each one of us all the time. Uh, Years ago, I had a conversation with a young husband and father named Tom. He had come to faith just in recent months, had been recently baptized. And so I met him in his home for coffee back when you could do that sort of thing, just to see how he was, how he was doing, how he was growing. And then he said to me this. He said, Pastor Brian, it's the weirdest thing. He said, for most of my life, I've struggled with self-control, especially with my anger, with my temper. But these last few months, I've noticed that I've just been way more patient than ever before. I told him, hey, I don't want to freak you out, but that's, that's the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. And then I quoted Galatians 5, 22. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. And when I said the word patience, Tom looked back at me and said, that is so cool. Yes, it is. And all of this is in this box, the revealed things box. But there's a lot more, too. In 1 Peter we read, For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. So I can tell you with great certainty that God's plan for you is to do good. In 1 Thessalonians 5 we read, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. I can tell you with great certainty that God's plan for you is that you be thankful. In 2 Corinthians 9, Paul writes, You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. I can tell you with great certainty that God wants you to grow in generosity. The point is, we can know a great deal about God's plan for our lives. It's right here in the Revealed Things box. But we do need to talk about something else. Secondly, what can't we know about God's plan? Now, let me ask an obvious question. Uh, who saw this coming? I mean, I mean this. I'm preaching here to an empty room. You're watching this from your home. 
If we flash back to March 1st, that's just about 150 days ago, feels like 150 years, doesn't it? Who saw a global pandemic coming? Who saw face masks and social distancing and canceled graduations and canceled sports seasons and church buildings closed and economic disaster and political upheaval? Who saw it all coming? And this leads me to this box, the secret things box. Two main things we cannot know about God's plan. We cannot know the future. Proverbs 27 says, do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. I have a weather app on my phone. Uh, My guess is you do as well. You probably checked it a couple times already today. I check it several times a day uh, and want to find out what's it going to be like. Is it going to be hot? Is it going to be windy? Is it going to rain? What's it going to be? How can I plan? What's the weather going to be tomorrow? How about this weekend? But here's the thing forecasts change. Sometimes they change multiple times in one day. As educated as we might be, as much technology as we have as human beings, we simply cannot know the future. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, we read, He, God, has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. Simply put, and we all know this, the future lies in the secret things box, and it's closed. We cannot know it. Secondly, we cannot know fully God's mind. We cannot know the mind of God. Isaiah chapter 55 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. In his book, Wishful Thinking, an author named Frederick Bigner says it this way. Theology is the study of God and his ways. For all we know, dung beetles may study humanity and our ways and call it humanology. If so, we would probably be more touched and amused than irritated. One hopes that God feels likewise. We cannot know fully the mind of God. We don't know how God knows each one of us by name, and yet the Bible says that he does. We don't understand why God allows certain things to happen, terrible things that happen in the world around us, and maybe maybe even in our own lives, yet the Bible says God makes all things work together for good for those who love him. We don't know how exactly this spiritual technology called prayer works, and yet Jesus taught us to pray. We don't know when Jesus is coming back, only that he promised to do so. We don't know. We cannot know. Because all these are in this secret things box. So, how then do we live in God's plan? How can we know we are living in God's plan? I think we have to focus on the right box. And we do that in three ways. First, by knowing his word. Know his word. Psalm 119 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. This is why every single sermon you hear at Chapel Street Church will be anchored in God's word. Because it's a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. A couple of years ago, I had a conversation with a man. I think we were in... Starbucks, and he was wrestling with a certain business opportunity that had come his way. It would have been extremely lucrative for him, but it would have been somewhat hurtful to others, people who had trusted him. And he was asking me the question, is this opportunity God's plan for me? I mean, it's a lot of money. It's a game changer for my family. But interestingly, he eventually answered his own question through his understanding of God's word. And he went back to a text Jeff actually taught on a couple of weeks ago where Jesus said, you cannot serve both God and money. He decided not not to take the opportunity. See, God's word is the lens through which we can see his plan most clearly. God's word is like a compass, our true north. If a business opportunity or a relationship is contrary to God's word, what he's already told us, it is not his plan for your life. If a behavior or a habit uh, is destructive to you or to others around you, it is not God's plan for you. Now, 
when we face certain day-to-day decisions in our lives, for example, what job to take or what university to attend, can and does God give us guidance through his Holy Spirit? Yes, he does and can. And we should seek his guidance and his wisdom. But most of what we need in order to make those decisions, we already have. And when we honor the truth and boundaries of God's word, we then can make all manner of decisions in glorious freedom and glorious joy. That's why Proverbs chapter 3 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. So know God's word. Secondly, love God and love your neighbor. Love God and love your neighbor. Jesus couldn't have been more clear when asked what was the greatest commandment, what God wants most for us as his people. Here's what he said, Matthew 22. And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. I was thinking about that this week. We all know this. It's like, yeah, duh, I know Jesus said that. But I was thinking about it. Jesus said this some 2,000 years ago at a time and in a place where the world was divided politically, ethnically, culturally, socially. The Romans ruled the Jews. The Jews hated the Romans. Even within Jewish culture, there were divisions and hostility between the Pharisees and the Herodians, between the rich and the poor, between ordinary people and the hated tax collectors. Into that divided and hostile and violent world, Jesus said, love God Love your neighbor as yourself. And he says the same to us today. In our divided, politically, divided, socially, divided economically, in our divided world. When we love God and our neighbor, we are living in and living out his plan for our lives. Thirdly, we can understand and use our gifts. In 1 Peter we read, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. The Bible teaches that when you come to faith in Christ, you receive the gift of forgiveness, the gift of salvation, the gift of the Holy Spirit, and then the Holy Spirit gives you a spiritual gift or spiritual gifts to use for his purposes. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now this might be a new idea for you, that you have a spiritual gift. How do we know what our gifts are? How do we discover them? Well, we discover our gifts at the intersection of our abilities, our passions, and the opportunities and needs that are all around us. And when we put our gifts into service in any of a million ways, we are living out God's plan for our lives. Here's the way I would summarize, and this is just me talking here. 95% of God's plan for your life, you can already know. It's in this box. It's the plan that has already been revealed for you and to you. 5% of it is over here in the secret things box, but we can't know what's in this box. It's unavailable to us, but here's the thing. When we focus on this box, when we receive the gift of God's grace, when we apply ourselves to growing in our faith, to sanctification, becoming like Jesus, when we bear fruit by using our gifts in his service, then the things in this box we can leave to God. We can trust those to God. Right during that time, when I was wrestling with the decision of marriage, uh, I happened to join a short-term mission trip to South America. At one point on that trip, our team was in a village in a very rural part of Bolivia, which felt like it was 10,000 miles from anywhere. And late one night while there, I, I took a walk to try to see Uh, the Southern Cross, which is a constellation of stars only visible from um, the Southern Hemisphere. 
And as I was walking, looking at the stars, I, all of this stuff is swirling in my mind and my heart uh, about, about whether or not to make the decision to get married. So I looked up at the night sky, and I just, I just started to pray in the best way I could. I prayed about all my questions. You know, Lord, w- will she change? Uh, will she want the things I want? Is she the one? Is she your plan for my life? And then, in, in just one of the handful of times, I can say with as much certainty as I know how that God whispered to me by his spirit. I sensed him say, you just worry about being the man I've called you to be. And I'll take care of her, he said. What he was saying is, invest yourself in this box. Invest yourself in what you already know that I want for you. And then trust me with this box. So, does God have a perfect plan for your life? Yes, he does. But not perfect in the way we usually think of perfect. But it's good. And it's not over here in this box. We shouldn't spend our time and energy worrying about this box. It's right over here in what he's already revealed to us, what he's already given us. We can know his plan for us. We can live in his plan for us. And we can live out his plan in our world. Would you bow as we pray together? Lord God, how we thank you today for your word. We worship you as the God who knows and controls all the secret things. We thank you for revealing to us through your word your great and good plan for each one of us. We thank you for the gift of your grace. Teach us to grow in faith. Teach us to bear much fruit and to live out your plan in the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.